Thank you, Athena. You're welcome. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the TSO regularly scheduled meeting. It is March 9th and it's 7.04 p.m. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so <clears throat> via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So we will call the meeting to order at 7.05 p.m. and I'll just do a run through to make sure that everyone can hear and be heard. Um, Andy. Yes, I'm here. Anna. Present. Shalini. Present. Dorothy. Yes, yes I am. Okay, uh, Paul. Hi, everybody. And our, our special guest, Chief Livingstone. I am here. And Athena. I'm here for now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you. So with that, I'm not sure if we have anyone with us here, but if we have anyone in the audience who would like to make comment and express their views for up to three minutes, please raise your hand so we can let you in. There's no, no one here. No one here? Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> with that, we have no appointments to be better to be filed today. And we will be moving our approval of uh, the March 2nd uh, minutes as they were not included to our next meeting on March 23rd. Uh, so then we'll move on to item number five, which is our surveillance use policy. And I believe we have uh, both, we have both on and Athena to uh, help us with bringing up both the bylaw and uh, <clears throat> the memos and reports. But I'd like to, at this time, uh, welcome Chief Livingstone and, and Paul with us as well. If there's anything that you would like to share in advance, include, make us uh, to be aware of um, any like sensitive dates, anything that you would like to share before we move into um, questions and, and comments for you, which I'm sure there's quite a few. <laughs> yeah, so I'd like to put, I'd like to frame what we're talking about tonight. So the last year, the town council approved a surveillance use bylaw. And under that bylaw, it said, if we're using any, a certain type of um, surveillance uh, technology that specifically focused on uh, facial recognition or something like that, uh, or could be used that way, that we had to bring that policy, that, um, that technology to the town council, we would do a technology impact report to summarize what the, what this technology did, and then recommend to you a surveillance use policy. And then under the bylaw, the, the council has to approve uh, a sur surveillance use policy so we can continue using or if we uh, this new this technology. And furthermore, if we ever bring in technology that that falls under the surveillance um, policy uh, bylaw we would follow the same process if we are want to buy, and I'm going to use an example that's very real, body cams, for instance, we would, before that happens, we would come to you, do a technology impact report, uh, um, propose, propose a policy, and then you would go through your process. So tonight, it's for you to look at the policy. The chief is here to talk about the, and specifically, we we're talking about in cruiser dash cams, and he'll tell you what they do, um, when they get activated, um, and uh, what they do with the info with the recorded information once they have. So, with that, uh, with your permission, Anika, we'll turn it to Chief Livingstone. Yes, please. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> specifically to the in-car video systems that we have in our cruisers, um, we were. The second, I'm I'm positive on the second police department in Massachusetts. I think we were the second police department in New England that actually started using in-car video systems. And 
the way it's set up is uh, we, we contracted with WatchGuard Video some 20 something years ago, which was a contractor that, you know, um, we worked with who installed camera systems and audio systems in all of our marked units at the time. And um, the way it works is anytime a officer goes out on patrol in a marked unit, and, um, and there are a couple of unmarked units that we use for traffic enforcement that are set up with them the, as well. Um, the officer logs into the system and it's just similar to when he logs into the uh, laptop computer in the cruiser. Um, and each officer is designated with that specific system. So we know who's using it, but um, after he, log, he or she logs in, they really have no control over the system. So it can't be manipulated or anything like that. And so basically the, it's really pretty simple. Um, once the system, the system turns on anytime a blue light is activated. So in a cruiser setup, you, and once you push a button to turn on the blue lights to pull over a vehicle, the system automatically goes into record mode. So, um, and then an officer is responsible for the moment he exits the cruiser to activate the, the uh, audio system as well. So when they walk up to a vehicle after a vehicle stop, it's recording and it's um, audio activated and they, they have the responsibility of notifying the operator of the motor vehicle that this is happening. Um, that's our responsibility. Um, people can request that it be turned off, but it can't be turned off. That process actually happens at the court system. So um, if somebody doesn't wanna be audio or video recorded, once the vehicle is stopped, they, they don't have the option to opt out. The officer doesn't. So um, they would have that option at the court proceeding if it involved like a drunk driving arrest or the um, somebody's appealing a ticket, that sort of thing. But um, that, you know, that's really it in a nutshell. Um, after the blue lights are turned off, the video shuts down and the audio, the audio is turned off. When the officer goes back to the station at the end of the shift, everything is automatically downloaded. So the officer doesn't have the ability to edit or, you know, turn anything off or on. It's automatically downloaded to our system at the police station. So the patrol officer who is actually operating the vehicle really has no ability to do anything with the system other than notify the operator that it's it's in use um it's really been designated to deal with all motor vehicle stops now <clears throat> there are there, there's a process in our system where an officer can activate um the camera system if for instance it's been used briefly for louts like large scale um, parties like we've had this weekend where they can activate the the um, camera system and just, you know, manipulate the um, camera so they could show like a large group of people, that sort of thing. But um, that's really it. You can't remove the camera system from the car. Um, you know, the officer has no ability to change anything in the system. Everything is really kind of automated. So, um, once an officer just stops a car, that's pretty much it. The system is, is over and done with. There are only three officers who have access to the system. So again, that's very um, strictly, you know, we have very strict policies on who has the, um, like I don't even have the ability to access that system. So um, it's detective bureau and an officer that oversees the IT part of it and a supervisor, so. I mean, that's really it. It's not complicated, but it's regulated. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I just have a, uh, I have a few questions. I just want to ask like, two technical mm -hmm. questions and then go over to Anna. So one is, so the audio packs that you were talking about that the officers have to um, turn on when they get out of the cruiser, 
Um, is there a way that that would automatically happen, say, in an emergency and someone just had to jump out without um, having the time to do that? Is there a distance? And then um, the second question, as body cameras were brought up, is the, the current technology used now, is that compatible with uh, body camera use or would there need to be a, a new system used and used and or purchased for that? Thank you, Sanika. So, um, so the audio part of it has to be activated by the officer. So it's not like voice activated or anything like that. When the officer leaves the, the um, cru cruiser, they have literally touch a button and it starts. And mostly that's because we have to notify the individual that they're being audio and video recorded by law. We have to do that. Um, specific to the vendor, um, you know, the vendor we started with a long time ago, um, <clears throat> It's called WatchGuard Video. They were bought out by Motorola Systems. It was lucky for us because Motorola handles all of our, um, and for many, many years, as long as I can remember, were our um, contractor for police radios and portable radios. So it was an easy transition for us to um, switch over from the, the system we had, WatchGuard, to Motorola. So all of the downloading and stuff was an easy system to replace. So if we go to a body camera system, and I know I put in a request, and I think most of you know, I put in a request for a capital line item for that. Um, I, I know we have to go out to bid for certain things, but Motorola is a major, one of the major players in the um, body camera systems and somebody that we would be looking to work with. Thank you. Yep. Anna. So I have a couple specific questions that we could, um, if you want to, to handle those. But I think one of my main things when we think about this and, and what I'm going to try to do, and I'll ask for accountability from my uh, from everybody on this call here is I'm, I'm going to try to keep this about surveillance use and not about the, the validity of, of cams and all, all of that. Um, but I think my question is that, or my, my concern when we think about surveillance use is that the way that dash cams versus body cams function is so different that I'd, I'd like to see two different policies on them. Um, and I, I, would, I wanna make sure that that's the direction that this is going um, at some point, or I'd love to ask that to be the direction that this goes, because I think that dash cams uh, and, and Paul, you you can cut me off here and say that is where you're going. That's totally fine. And I don't need to go on a. Yeah, no, it, it, if we go body cams, that would requ require an entirely new process with an Great. entirely new policy. And the chief would have to develop a policy for the police department. And then we would have to go through this policy, through the bylaw to have a separate policy. It would be two separate standalone policies. You're correct. Thank you so much. That was that was my, my number one concern. Um, okay, so second I guess, can I get into some more nitty gritty stuff? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So when we're looking through the policy, it says that you store it for seven days, only seven days, Does unless it flags one of the other, uh, like it was a criminal or an arrest was made or something like that, in which case you store it longer. Is that correct? That's correct. So if it, if it didn't uh, trigger one of those other um, elements that would have it be saved for longer. Does that mean that civilians would have seven days to file a complaint if they wanted that that might include dash cam footage? That's correct. So after that time frame, we don't have the ability to retract to regain that that information. So um, okay, the system we currently have. Um, and because we are in the process of upgrading it, um, and I would have to check with our IT guys. And the last time I checked with them, that was the maximum length that we could hold that information. Um, that may change as the, you know, imp as the as we upgrade our new to a newer system. Some of the stuff we have is mm -hmm. five to six years old. So um, we have over the years been upgrading the equipment. 
because it changes a lot and a, a lot quick quickly. So um, I could find that out for you, Anna. It's okay. I think it was more of just I wanted to confirm that that would mean that someone would have seven days and um, to file if they if there were if there were to be a complaint. Um, and I'm not necessarily sure that I have a a strong opinion. One way I can argue at both sides, right? In terms of, of yeah. surveillance and, and use of data, it's better to have it shorter, but in terms of accessibility and, and filing uh, complaints, maybe longer. So I'm I'm not coming down on one side or another, but I was I just wanted to confirm that that's what that meant. Um, and then to that same token, is there some sort of notification if um, that do people know that that data is then saved or downloaded? Um, mm -hmm when you are doing it does the, the, the does the person in the video or do all parties in the video know that that data has been stored in some way probably not unless it's an arrest situation and then okay. they wouldn't be notified because of the arrest reports that their attorney would be privileged to so for a for a standard motor vehicle stop <clears throat> let's say somebody was upset the way it was handled or they didn't like <clears throat> excuse me, the way the officer handled it, they would not know necessarily that that data was only stored for that, that amount of time. And if you did pull it, so I guess, let me, let me ask my other little question. Is it really a disc still? Is it really downloaded onto a disc? No, we download and it gets sent directly for, so for purposes, well, we do quite frankly, we do load it, download it to a disc for our own okay. purposes because that's the easiest way for us to store for, we'll keep things for 20 years. So the other, and that's according to IT, the most secure way to make sure that it doesn't get lost in the cloud. What, what we do though, for purposes of like DUIs and stuff, that gets downloaded directly to the DA's office. So they have a copy of it. So then what's the server that we pay for? The server is through Motorola and I mean, um, and I should have brought somebody on from IT here because no, it's, I mean, it's, it's okay. We're paying for the services of storing and downloading. Maybe I can ask a clarifying question. So when you, the cruiser returns from their shift, yep. do they have to do something physical to download the information from the or does it happen out of, is it done wirelessly through the air or do they, how does that work? It's wireless through the air. So the minute, the server. Oh, sorry. All right. So the minute the cruiser backs into the back parking lot, it downloads to the system. And then if they want something preserved or stored, then they have the option to go down and download it for purposes of, um, and 99% of the time, it's for a drunk driving arrest. Okay. So that's where the that's where the infer that's where the storage is. That makes sense. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um okay. Right. And then oh, oh, we'll oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I guess I, I am confused. Uh it's stored only for seven days, but then it can be stored to a disk for 20 years. I, I'm just getting a lot of contradictory information here. Um I think from, from if, if I were involved in something, which luckily I haven't been, um seven days i might not even know to even think to ask before seven days is up but some things are stored and some things aren't and it's not clear to me at all after the last conversation so is there some things you store some things you don't or all things get stored or some get stored for seven days some get stored for longer it's Every, confusing yes yeah, sure dorothy everything gets stored for seven days and then if we need something for evidentiary purposes like a, a trial that's going to come down the road in a year for a drunk driving, the officer burns that to a disc uh, and that goes to the district attorney's office. So um, if there's just a standard police, mm -hmm. somebody gets stopped for running a red light, yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't save that material for any longer than seven days. You can get options to store it for longer than that, but you have to pay for it. Mm-hmm. So you know right away whether you need to store or not. Haven't you had situations when you said, oh, darn, I wish we'd saved that. Now we see we're going to have a problem. I mean, not, for just a, not, just for a, not for just a routine car stop, no. No, okay. Andy. 
Well, I was thinking about the question first that Anna raised, and I've been listening to both questions. And I guess uh, when you get into this, um, you have to start with the purpose that's uh, Section A of the uh, bylaw, the technology, the service uh, bylaw 3.59. The purpose of this bylaw is to provide for the regulation of surveillance technology acquisition or use by the city known as the town of Amherst or the use of the surveillance data it provides to safeguard the right of individual privacy to uh, individuals right to privacy balanced with the need uh, essentially for uh, public safety and uh, so I question um, whether we're getting into uh, issues that are unrelated to the stated purpose that was put into Section A of the bylaw. And uh, I guess the other thing uh, to Dorothy is, is that um, as I understand the system, uh, having read the uh, report, the uh, uh, only after seven days, uh, because of the limited capacity of the, uh, of the system <laughs> to save data, um, that, uh, that that there's just a, a limit to the size of that server or whatever storage is in it, that it has to be burned to a uh, disk. And that's probably, I would gather, a... Uh, function that requires personnel to actually do something to, to burn it onto a disk. <laughs> and, uh, so I think that what we're dealing with in, in um, that is a uh, uh, just the age of the equipment that we have in the system we have. So those are my observations. Thank you, Andy. I had a, um, a follow-up to the seven-day uh, the seven day questions before going to Anna. So I thought I I, let, I thought it was spelled out uh, pretty clearly um, what reasons I, that the video would be saved. Um, but what I may have missed, or I'm not sure if it was there, is it just up to the officer's discretion of what they save? Or is there um, like another another set of eyes that's looking within the department to look at the, the footage as well? Um, to weigh so, in. Yeah, so the officer um, certainly could say to his supervisor, let, or he or she comes back and says, you know, I, I stopped a car on North Pleasant Street and it got really contentious. Is that something we could save? Yeah, they certainly would have that ability to do that. Um, and then, you know, that would generate a report to me and to the captains, like, we had something where we felt there may be an issue here. Um, they certainly have that option, for sure. But that would be done at like the, in, during the shift. Mm -hmm. So that's not something they would typically say four days later, for instance, and say, hey, we better save that. Um, and then just last, if after that seven days and the footage is deleted, is it, is it gone forever? Is there any way that it you could um, retract anything? My understanding is it's gone forever. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anna. Thank you. So I think, Andy, to your point, I, I would argue that talking about the um, how the data is stored and and um, for how long really is about the the use of the surveillance da surveillance data that that technology provides, which is like the second part of that that purpose statement, um, because it is how they're use how we use the data and how we access uh, and and the privacy of individuals in terms of where that data is stored and for how long. Um, and so I I wanted to just kind of explain why my questions I felt were relevant to, to this. Um, the only other thing I had was about um, the public records requests with these types of videos. Um, does that mean that things are redacted from the video? And if so, who does that redaction or like blurring or anything like that? Um, I'm thinking about public records requests of text, 
like documents and such where things are redacted and how that functions if um, it's a video and if so, who does that? Um, and I recognize that this particular question might be in the weeds a little bit more than is necessary, but if you feel like entertaining my curiosity, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, Anna, so it depends on who would request the video. Um, you know, obviously, if it's somebody who's been arrested in an OUI case, they would get the entire video. Nothing would be redacted. If somebody, a third party, wanted to... Um, request a vehicle or car stop there would be certain things that would definitely vary it's it follows the guidelines of like a police report if you wanted a police report of an individual certain things would be redacted um that would be identifying that individual whether it's date of birth name certain things of that nature so you know and we do the redactions on that and we and that's I also should add that's that's per state law. So there we have to follow the state law on redaction stuff. So here's what you have to redact. Here's what you're allowed to give to the, the public. So it's Thank not you. something we're just picking out of on our own. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. I believe. Well, let's go to Shana. You haven't asked a question yet. Sure, thank you. Um, I think one of the concerns we hear in the community is certain groups feeling over survey, sur what's the word, surveyed? Sur yeah. Surveilled. Surveilled, okay, thank you. So, uh, and since it's discretionary for the police person to do the recording, do we have a sense of, uh, in terms of the crime statistics, um, what is the proportion of recordings done for different community groups or or just do you have a sense of if that feels like this is being implemented you know free from any prejudice or you know what i'm saying i think i know where you go i think um so they have to they don't have control over what's being recorded in mm -hmm. other words any car stop that they make and 99%, they don't really know who they're stopping. So they wouldn't know if it was a person of color, a white person or a male or female. Um, once they initiate the, the system to turn the blue lights on, the camera automatically goes on and they don't have the ability to shut that off. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that answers your question. Um, I will, uh, I think it was on a, maybe you answered, earlier about the storage of um, video. The, that's the biggest contention right now. And I'm going to go off on a little bit of a into the weeds. When it comes to body cameras, the, the cost to municipalities for storage of body cameras is really expensive. Um, there are a lot of, there are a number of police agencies that have actually done away with body cameras. Cincinnati, you can Google them. Cincinnati is being one of them who mm -hmm. was under a federal mandate to um, install body cameras. And they've since done away with them because it became so expensive for the storage portion of the video and audio um, of that system. So um, it's the prices are coming down, but it, it is a concern. There's no question about it. Thank you, Chalani. Andy, I believe you're next. Yeah, I was just uh, following up on Anna, who's following me. Uh, I had understood you to be uh, concerned that somebody who had been stopped did not get very much notice that they only had seven days to um, request mm -hmm. uh, that they get a copy or it might be um, destroyed. And that's where I was getting into the question of whether in that particular situation, uh, making um, the video footage available to the individual who has stopped is consistent with the purpose. And that was the reason I raised the purpose question. Sure. And, and and I'll say it here. I, I can't ever recall anybody requesting the um, audio and video of a car stop. 
except for the individuals that have been arrested, like an OUI case or something like that. It just, it hasn't happened. Um, sitting here now, I guess I'm a little surprised to say that. I would think it would have, but all of those public records requests come through my office and I can't ever recall anybody ever requesting that information. Thank you. Dorothy. Um, well, I, I, I'm going to draw attention to three different passages talking about the same thing because I'm finding it a little confusing. Um, the officer, I'm on page uh, four. The officer must take precaution to ensure the cruiser with the in-cruiser video and audio system is positioned correctly. So that's going back to something that we were told. Not all cruisers have the in-cruiser video and audio system. And um, that can present a problem, um, I think, in some cases, um, because back now we're on page six, and it says the purpose of the technology is to document through audio and video recordings all motor vehicle traffic stops for those marked police vehicles that have in cruiser video and audio systems. So some motor vehicle traffic stops are not recorded because the cruiser that pulled them over is not equipped with it. So that, that is chance and maybe discretion could be involved there. And then uh, again, on the last page, um, well, now this is a, a kind of like a repeating, on, this is on page two. It seems like there were like the same thing was said twice and this one has a border around the page. Um, this operating directive allows for operator discretion and judgment for the appropriateness of use in enforcement activities and special events. However, there is no allowance for the failure in video and audio record each motor vehicle stop. So I guess what I'm getting at is um, that some cars can do record and some can't. And um, it's not just the same treatment for everybody. And, you know, we're talking about trying to keep a situation where people um, don't feel suspicious um, and, and don't feel, think that they're being targeted or whatever, that, that whatever happens to them is the same that would happen to anybody else. But um, it's not going to be uniform because some cars have this and some cars don't. And um, so I'm, I'm bringing that up just because I could see in some situations that there might be a problem with that. So, you know reassure me <laughs> so. yeah so i get that Dorothy. for instance um quite frankly today i made a car stop probably the first one i've made in two years where somebody right in front of the jones library didn't stop for a pedestrian and i was behind them and i pulled it over my car does my vehicle does not have an in-car video system so the majority of the unmarked administrative vehicles do not have in it's all of the um, it's all the marked vehicles that okay. the patrol officers drive and the sergeant and the supervisor drives that have them so okay. the ones that are going to be involved in motor vehicle stops most of the time you're right um could we do every car yes it would be a little expensive mm -hmm. to, to, but do you see that there could be a has anyone ever said you targeted me or um you didn't video them and you videoed me or have have you not had that problem it, it hasn't come up yet but yeah i can see where like even today with me if somebody wasn't happy the way i handled the car stop they could have filed a complaint for sure yeah okay thank you though i imagine you were probably a little bit irate uh i wasn't irate i think the person crossing the street was because they had to skedaddle across but um and the person had a legitimate well, semi-legitimate excuse, but um, yeah, it all worked out. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, Shalini. Yeah, this is about the complaints process and uh, we don't have a resident oversight board, but once we have that, is this something that would go there? The complaints, it's, right now it says the complaints can be submitted to the police, town manager, human rights and DEI. Um, um, I would, I would assume it would, I mean, Paul might have a better, uh, if that's the direction that the town wants to go in and the community wants to go in, I would assume that would be part of the process. Sure. Paul, 
the yeah so so i think it it certainly could um i think that's a conversation that will happen when we start to work through the police resident oversight board um and, and i also just want to point out, i think something andy sort of referenced this bylaw was put to, in place because people were nervous that the town was retaining information for too long and it would yeah. be stored and then brought up years later with oh i've got video of you doing this or that or the other thing or, or images of you um and that was the concern <laughs> was how long we were going to be storing it and, and, and but it's i think it since this bylaw has been put in place you know different things have happened and people are now looking at it through a different frame of reference saying well what if people want to protect themselves in, in a sense by having this this video recording of their interaction with the police department yeah, I was actually going to, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Oh, I, and I think from the police officer's point of view, they see the police officers I've spoken to want body cams because they feel like that would enhance mm -hmm. their protection for, and, you mm -hmm. know, they're proud of how they do their work. They want it to be reported and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I think we see body cams. It's been really useful in a lot of incidents where it was, it's been impugning of police actions. So. Yeah, I, I can just tell you. When it comes to the police officers, let's say there's a cruiser that's but the video system is down. They prefer not to take. They want to be. They want their car stops to be to be audio, audio and video recorded. Right. It's it's a protection. Yeah. Can I just ask a follow up question? Kind sure. of not follow up actually. It's a related question that the you know we had sent out uh, lynn had sent out an invitation for questions around this and i was wondering if the sponsors of this bylaw because do they feel like this report is addressing the concerns for which this bylaw was written and i think paul was sort of alluding to that but did we hear from anyone else about any other questions I don't know if any other questions came to Lynn. Um, I honestly don't remember who the sponsors were since this became a council bylaw. Who sponsored it was, didn't become that important to me. And Hi, there's Mandy and uh, Mandy Joe and and Pat Dangelis. And I had um, I had asked Lynn to send the the question to the councilors, and there were none that had come. Back. I mean, just the because we. One of the things requested was the the crime report or something and i'm wondering what we've been provided is that in is that what they were looking for because it seems really very general the crime statistics and so you know that a crime statistics the in cruiser videos deployed in police cruisers and i mean this like were they thinking of getting more specific reports there or was this sufficient Oh, so I, th I think that's a good question. This is the first time we've done it. And so we put together what we thought was in response to the bylaw. I read the bylaw very carefully, tried to align the we have a pol we have, the police department already had a policy. So we applied the policy the police department had to the policy that would apply to the bylaw. So they were pretty much aligned. Um, but the council says this actually is inadequate. We would like more information. Give me some direction and we can work on that. And also, so, um, you know, I did meet and uh, talk with Mandy Joe about this and, um, you know, their perspective as, as well as um, Pat's. And so some of the point of tonight's discussion was looking at them and looking at what has to be included and, you know, what uh, we may have questions about and think should be included as well. So, and I would just add, um, Anika, that you know, we we review policy our policies every year, and so if there is something that the town council is like, hey, we're not comfortable with this in the Amherst Police Department policy, have you guys thought about this? That's something we could certainly review, look at, entertain. Um, most of our policies are based in best practices nationwide so you know we're not the obviously not the only police department that uses in-car video systems and a lot of it is generated from and now a lot of our policies in massachusetts 
have been reviewed by the post commission. So they will make recommendations. So, you know, the, the Amherst town council is not the only one looking at this, I guess is my point. And so if you guys have questions or recommendations that you think might be some, something you would want to entertain, I mean, that's doable. You know, I'm not saying we would switch everything that you want, but we would certainly have that conversation. Thank you. And just just um, a quick follow up to your point. So I also had a question about in the so that when when um, I think that it was in the bylaw that there would be a request for uh, crime statistics. Um, is that so? Were those statistics or what they are in your point of the state? So are are those categories? If they are categories, are they determined by the state? or uh, nationally, or, uh, or does um, the, the APD decide what those statistics would be? It, so it sounds like from what you just said that it was by, by state or nationally. So a lot of the stats, well, it's, a little, it's everything. So the federal government requires us to submit certain stats and the state requires us to you know, submit certain stats. And then we give to the town, like for instance, you know, Boston, maybe not keep stats on, I don't know, open container violations, right? That we would. So, but we're all required, all police departments are required to do the same thing at, for the federal and state level. Uh, and then each independent off, uh, municipality will keep their own stats on certain bylaws they have. Thank you. If I could just add to that. So I think, you know, that was a question I had when I wrote this, the crime statistics. Um, it, well, the way it's written, it's it's sort of the way I read that. It's like, are we putting cameras in a certain neighborhood to surveil people, you know, or something like um, on the bike path because there's been a series of crimes. And then then the, the, the that question would be, well, what crimes have been committed there that makes you want to put a camera there? Since these are deployed townwide and can be used anywhere, I didn't really know how, what to put in there for crime statistics. If there were things that you wanted, we could certainly get that information if it exists and put that right. in there. Thank you. Anna. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna kind of play off some of my thoughts here. And and it's, again, it's not an ask. It's more of, I'm curious if this is what, cause you're right. I mean, when, when you read 2A of that, um, of the bylaw, it talks about if applicable crime statistics for any locations, the technology will be deployed. And this is a movable technology. Um, I do think that it would be beneficial to, okay, I'm gonna say it and I, I'm, not, I'm not actually sure if it would be beneficial or not. But if we think about where this has been deployed, it's pretty much almost every traffic stop, um, I would I'd say based on this. But am I correct that you have this in 12 cars based on, the financial section said we have 12 systems. Yeah, if that's what I submitted at the time, I'm sure that's accurate. Okay. And again, from time to time, it may change. You know, one may be broken. There might be 10 on one particular week. But it, and generally speaking, 12 marked cru cruisers would be, be what we've, we've contracted for and pay for. Yeah, because I know, I mean, it's not, I think this is more a, more a look at the bylaw itself. And I'm not trying to dig into that. But I think that's more helpful for us to know, especially for this type of technology is, you know, how many systems are out there and, and you got to it in the financial part, but you could have explained the financial part without necessarily saying that. And so I think Paul, for, for our information, that's probably going to be more helpful so that we know how much data collection technology is out there in terms of that is, is surveilling. Um, you know, I, I think that in terms of crime statistics, it's beneficial, it would be beneficial to know where these were deployed but I also suppose we could just look at general crime statistics for the town to know that because they should be used in most stops, if that makes sense. And, and, and I feel like I don't even know if that would be helpful or not because it's, yeah, like I think that gets at generally more of the question of where are stops happening broadly, dash cams or not. And so I don't actually know that that's super helpful for surveillance. I mean, we track that as part of our um, data collection for racial, um, yeah, right. right. So we track where people make car stops um, annually. 
and, and the demographic of those stops. And we publish that, so that's available. Um, yeah, because I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason to where officers make crime, I mean, make, make vehicle stops. We usually go where the public wants us to go. So yep. like when they say, hey, look, everyone's speeding on Bay Road, we'll tell the district I'm officers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, Lincoln Avenue, I bet you there's a bunch of them on Lincoln Avenue. Just yeah. this past week, we did a whole bunch of them on Henry Street oh. for the common school. So so it might be helpful if we think about the, I guess I'm, I'm trying to go back and I'm keeping Andy in mind as in terms of really staying to the purpose. If we think about the purpose being understanding where and or how and how much our residents and visitors are being surveilled, it might be beneficial if in those stop in that stop data we include something of was this recorded, um, and if we eventually do have body cams on every officer or cruiser cams in every car, then it becomes a moot point. But because we don't right now, I think it might be worth adding like as a checkbox or something into that data so that we can we could look to see if there are some areas of town. Oh shoot, sorry, I froze. Um, if there are some areas of town where surveillance is happening more than others, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I think, go ahead, Dave. go ahead, Chief. I'm getting, we don't surveil anybody for on vehicle stops. Um, you know, that's, I mean, I guess I'm being, I'm a little confused about maybe the bylaw and what an in-car video system does. Um, you know, the way this was originally proposed to me was facial facial recognition. Um, and it doesn't have that ability to do that. Um, you know, maybe I should have brought a standard vehicle stop along. You, you, most of the time, you can't even tell who the individual is in the car yeah. because the, the camera itself is, is in the is mounted on the dashboard of the cruiser. You, you don't know, even know who's being stopped. Um, so there's no surveillance of an individual. So the way so there's no body camera on an individual. There is what you, you're, what you're seeing is it's really about officer safety. And then the conversation between the officer and the individual, you never see the individual's face in a vehicle stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the way that our bylaw defines it, it it includes this. I mean, it it specifically does say vehicle cameras, but I think that it might, even though it's not necessarily those like super clear identifying features like you're talking about, it it might still kind of cover that idea of primarily intended to collect, retain, process, or share audio, visual, location, or I'm, I'm skipping a couple specifically associated with or capable of being associated with any individual or group. So I, th I think that if you could tell, it's not necessarily just facial recognition, but if you could tell who the person was because of the video, I think that's what makes it fall under. That's my interpretation, but I, I see Andy has his hand up and so he might have a different interpretation. Let's go ahead, Andy. No, I was just thinking that this is an interesting conversation and raises a question of whether we should be looking at the policy again and commenting on the whether the policy is what we really think is most important. Um, and uh, what I, the example the chief was giving about when somebody stops, you can't see their face, you can't use facial recognition. Well, the identification of the individual is only gonna come play uh, when they have their driver's license, and that's not something that I understand to be attached to the video. It's attached to the, uh, I assume, the ticket that's being issued or other arrest report. And if a person doesn't have identification, then there's a whole other set of circumstances that start applying. Um, but uh, it really has nothing to do with the uh, video itself. So it might be worth uh, think, rethinking some of these issues. I think that the other thing that I've observed in this conversation is that uh, 
we have, you know, again, as the chief said, in a different context, the circumstances of how people react to the importance of videos has changed in its, uh, from when, you know, even a few years ago, because of what has happened in um, some very unfortunate um, situations around the country, not locally. And um, it has made people uh, very nervous, actually, a little bit local, too, uh, when you go back to last summer. So uh, we, we probably ought to look at it, but I really um, want to also pause to thank both the chief and town manager, because I think that it was a report that was consistent with what was requested. And it has been a very helpful report because it has given us the ability to uh, not just uh, look at that particular system, the vehicle uh, recording system, but also to think about the bylaw again. So um, I do want to uh, make sure that we uh, thank uh, Scott and Paul for providing this report. Strongly agree. Yeah, Strongly agree. I would also like to express our thanks and just a couple of um, <clears throat> comments. I think we're talking about a few different things here. Um, the, the way I've read the report and the, the bylaw and, and in seeing, though I must say I haven't taken the, the, the cruiser drive to see what these what this camera looks like through your car. But even if we see the news or some, you know, cop shows and we, you know, see what we look what, what this looks like, though there are some entertaining videos on, on the internet, you know, when some people get out and then you have interactions. But I think there's a huge difference between um, this type, this use and surveillance and facial recognition. I mean, facial recognition equipment has been, you know, clearly linked with racial profiling because it's just off, you know, um, <clears throat> and it really doesn't work for a lot of uh, people of color. It can be confusing. What we're talking about here, my understanding, if you have a stop and someone is doing something speeding or whichever, uh, to be stopped, you most likely would not see who that person is until there's that interaction, right? And then that interaction is recorded. And, you know, to Andy's point about also uh, body cams, which have either saved many lives, um, held many accountable, and, you know, I know lots of people talk about just 2020 George Floyd, but before that, there were a lot of horrific in encounters, if you're talking about, you know, the, of the George Floyd that were captured, you know, years before this and, and ongoing. So, um, you know, I would also like to express thanks for, you know, to both Paul and Chief Livingstone for I think what was a very clear proposal for us to think about it, but also just to keep in mind the difference between um, surveilling people, surveilling individuals, surveilling groups, surveilling neighborhoods and dash cams and body cams for safety of both the officers and the individuals that they interact with and, and um, the record keeping that they provide and how much that we have seen and learned and witnessed. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, and, and, and we have had plenty of, you know, we've had enough issues in Amherst history and as of late where if we had, you know, recording, if we had body cams, I mean, we probably would have had a lot less uh, questions or time around um, certain issues. So I would just like us to keep those uh, in mind. Anna. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm always grateful for, um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to break myself of calling you only chief, but I'm, I'm very grateful for Scott's willingness to kind of go back and forth on this. I think it's been really interesting. Uh, our surveillance technology bylaw is is much more broad than than just facial recognition. And I think that that's, you know, to Andy's point, if that means we need to revisit, that means we need to revisit. But I really do think that if if dash cam videos didn't help us, if if you couldn't identify who a person was with the dash cam video and other supporting, you know, whatever, 
then we wouldn't be doing them. And so, you know, okay, that's a, a little bit broad, but, you know, I think that there's, there's still an ability to, to roughly tell who a person is. And, and so I think that, you know, it, it is still surveilling in that sense of it's collecting data on someone's actions. Right. And so, um, based on, again, based on the, the way that our bylaw defines it, I do think that that is what, I, that's why I'm, I think about kind of that, that check mark of where it's occurring in terms of if we were tracking that on our stops. Um, I'm not necessarily expecting to find anything, but I do think that uh, it's helpful given that we don't have it in all of our cars um, to just so we, that we can say, you know, we're not only sending the cars with surveillance to this area. I know you're not like, I know you're not, but I think that that's something that that could be helpful in terms of the data part of this this report um, going forward. If it's not a location based technology, if that if that makes sense, I don't know. And again, that's that's more about how we collect the reports. It's not really about the actual policy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dorothy. Um, I just have a a totally different track. Um, you, uh, Chief, you said you liked Motorola and it would be, they're very good in the next uh, technology you might be using. My mind immediately goes to don't ever put all your eggs in one basket. Companies buy, sell and die. And I was thinking what would happen if, if you had everything really working beautifully integrated with one company and that company disappears or goes bankrupt or is bought out by somebody and you wouldn't have any technology. So I... Just wanted to put that kind of um, thought out yeah, there. Yeah, Dorothy, thank you. And that's happening with our radio system. So um, we have a capital request in and it's a couple of years down the road yeah. because the company that almost 90% or maybe it's 80% of the police departments use in New England are going out of business and basically gave us five years to fix things oh, on our own. Okay. That's good. Yeah, let just give you a chance to catch up on that. Pretty yeah. much, yeah. So yeah, it does happen. Um, the, the original company we contracted with, Watch Guard Video, mm -hmm. was bought out by Motorola. So um, yeah, it happens. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Andy, I'm getting back to what um, Paul's request was. And my, I think I just want to put a motion on the floor so we can focus on what the purpose of this discussion was. In the, and that is um, making, I'm making a motion to approve the surveillance use policy for in cruiser video and audio at the police department. Second. And uh, I think- Could you, you repeat the motion, Andy? Yeah, it just is straight out of the first um, paragraph in the memo that we received mm -hmm. from Paul dated December 5th, 2022. And um, it's to the town council. And I think the only thing that I was uncertain about is whether we are approving or we're recommending that the town council approve. Uh, uh, but uh, the request was to approve the surveillance use policy for in cruiser video and audio at the police department. Yeah. I understood it as we were recommending, we would recommend that the council- Then I, then, then I um, change it if, uh, with the permission of the seconder to recommend to the town council that it approve. That's fine. We can't unilaterally decide things. That's okay. I agree. <laughs> well, the memo says to town council. So it's right there on the memo that the town council is the one that's going to be voting on it finally. So actually, I have to look at the bylaw to get the answer for sure, but which I didn't do in the few seconds that I mm -hmm. had to think about where we were going with this. Mm -hmm. So do we call the question or what do we do? Just ask one last, one last little, little teeny question. I'm sure that this is the case of the Sister Chief. Now, if there is a public record request 
uh, from the public, would it go without saying that if there were uh, minors involved or anything that that they would be blurred out or? Yeah, so we would follow the same guidelines that we do for just normal requests that uh, minors can't be identified. Okay, all right, just sorry, I had to ask that, okay. We're ready to move on and, and call the vote. So Shalini. Yes. Dorothy. Yes. Andy. Yes. Anna. Yes. And I am a yes. Thank you uh, so much for that. And, and um, congratulations, Chief Livingstone, on your retirement and your service to Amherst for 46 years. I did not realize you grew up with the department. Um, and thank oh, you wow. so much. <laughs> well, you. I kind of kept it on the down low, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And you're more than welcome to stay with us, but we've taken up so much of your evening. <laughs> and just so you know, my daughter um, confiscated the nice cap that you gave me from ah. the, so <laughs> You gave it to me and she took it over, so. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. We'll make sure you get it replaced. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, you guys. Have a great night. See ya. Night. Um, and you know, just one one comment. In yeah. the re in the report, should we just uh, write that that we voted in support of it? But just get that clarification, maybe from the 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 sponsors, whether that crime is that, because I, I actually am good with the answer you gave, Paul, that the intention of that was to just be like, this is being, you know, you know, where is it being used and it's being used everywhere. But I think that's the only point that we may want clarification from the sponsors, if that is what their intention was. And is this uh, answering, is this uh, response answering the, what they were looking for? Yeah. Maybe we, maybe we can just send that that information out again so the council is aware. Yeah. Before. Thank you for that, Shani. Uh, okay, so we will move on to the open meeting law update, which may not apply to us because after our <clears throat> our meeting on March 23rd, we do not meet again until uh, for 20, April 20th. Um, but in the, if it does happen that we need to uh, accommodate uh, and we need to meet in person, um, I just wanted to get, get a sense from the committee, you know, how everyone feels, um, what anyone, you know, does anyone have issue with meeting in person if we have to? Um, and, and then, of course, you know, if anyone would be out of town, um, you know, for April 20th or, you know, during that time and just, you know, open up to any, you know, just general thoughts about it. Not out of town and we'll wait and see, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Same here. All right. And that, but everyone is is good to meet in person if we have to if that does happen. I think Paul. And I would just say. Um, oh, sorry, Paul. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I would just say that yeah, we totally in, in expect them to do something. Um, you know, probably extended. What happened last time is it, they didn't act right by March thirty first. You know, whatever the date was. So we have shared out information that can be posted um, on 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 meeting notices and that could transfer into in-person or virtual, depending on what happens with the law. Okay. All right. So there's that. Um, are there any announcements? Hmm. Anyone have an announcement? The um, Amherst High School Musical is uh, happening this weekend, which is very exciting. Um, and one of my one of my old high school friends is the, now the, the dance teacher and he's I'm very proud of all the dance numbers, but uh, given the current situation with the teachers doing work to rule, they're really finding themselves in a pinch in terms of ushers and support for the um, for the production this weekend. So if folks are interested in um, 
in supporting in this way and serving as ushers or going and, and watching the musical as well. Um, I believe that is welcome. And, you know, I don't know where to send you exactly, but I can tell you roughly where to go, which is to, to reach out to the folks in the performing arts at the high school um, if you're interested in, in serving in that capacity. Thanks, Anna. We have the Tibetan flag raising uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. And I think, Andy, you are next. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I should just briefly report, and Anna, who is there too, so she can also add to it, um, the Transportation Advisory Committee um, met immediately before this meeting, which actually, I might note, is their standard practice and could be a problem if we have to go to in-person meetings um, ever, then it might be a logistical mm -hmm. barrier because uh, we were also supposed to have one member of our committee be liaison, which is right now me. But I know it's there also because she's co-sponsor of the uh, uh, lighting bylaw, uh, which or lighting policy, which was the um, topic of discussion today. And uh, I think we'll leave it for TAC to give the, their ultimate report on it because that's the appropriate thing to do, of course. Uh, but they tended to look at it um, from the traffic safety and pedestrian safety perspective, I think was uh, dominated their discussion. And uh, they were not uh, focusing on the other part of the purpose, which was the uh, uh, the sky, the uh, protecting the light in the sky. Um, so, um, but we'll let Tech uh, make its report. But I just wanted to at least give that much report. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Dorothy. So I want to ask Anna some things about the musical. Um, I have tickets for Saturday night and may not be able to go. Um, but if I do go, I could certainly usher. Um, my family is coming back from Paris and I want to see my granddaughter who's only may only be available for me that day. So in which case, um, I would love to go and um, see the show and usher it on Sunday. Now, is that a possibility? But when I go, I will usher. Um, I believe so. But let me really quickly, Dorothy, look up the, the person that you should get in touch with because I heard this secondhand. And so I'm passing right. on it. So and um, I'll, I'll send you, let me look it up really quick and get right back to you. So I also want to say one thing. I used to have a terrible time trying to find out when the show was. I would call the school. I would go online. I'd look at the calendars and I could not find it. But since they went to Eventbrite, Eventbrite now emails me and tells me. So this is, I've only been here 12 years trying to find out when the shows are because I go to high school shows. Um, and so tell your friends that it made a big difference because it, I had no idea the show was coming, but then I get the little notice and this is new and a, a good use of technology for the school. So, um, Love that. so if you go to arps.org slash ARHS, Mm -hmm. slash, slash performing dash arts. Okay, start that again, please. Yep, of course. Arps, A R P S dot org. Right. Okay. Backslash A R H S. Backslash performing dash arts. Dash arts. Okay. Dash being the little line, not the, um, <laughs> not the word. <laughs> okay. Yes, right, right. The, 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 the one, one yeah, that's at the bottom, right? Yeah. Okay. I have a, a couple of little quick interesting ones that are going on with the town. I was invited to, I participated in a class at um, Amherst College from the Native American Studies, and there's actually a project going on where they're doing, it's like a, a picture book, um, that's being developed and they're coordinating with fourth graders at Wildwood Elementary School. And mm. as a of Wildwood, I just loved that. And, um, and then uh, afterwards I was able to see, uh, there were some great exhibits that were at the Mead Museum, Mead Museum there. One was uh, James Baldwin, another was a um, Black Art Matters. Um, 
with uh, students there and they had featured our um, Alyssa, our own Alyssa here from uh, Carefree Cakery, the new bakery coming to um, the Mill District. And last, and uh, speaking of street and sidewalk safety, uh, District 4 will be having the next uh, community walk on uh, Wednesday, I believe that is March 22nd at 6.30 p.m. and we will meet at the corner of Kendra Park by the Rotary and we will be walking through um, McClellan, Lincoln and Faring Street. So Dorothy, I'm sure you and uh, I hope that you and Jennifer and anyone else will join as well. Yeah, I don't have the details on that. I, I don't. Wednesday, March 22nd. I'll email you. Um, great, great, Jennifer great. As well. I'd definitely be interested. Um, so I would just comment about the exhibit at, at Amherst College. I went to the opening and it was very exciting and well done. I, I love the ink drawings of James Baldwin. There were so many people there. I couldn't get to hear Hilton Alls. There were just all the young people crowded around. But there is a video presentation, kind of like a puppet shadow play by, and my mind is blank, but she's a, a famous young black artist who does cutouts, little black and white silhouette cutouts and then she did them in a shadow play, and it's 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 absolutely incredible. And I hope it's still there. It is, you know. yeah. yeah. It is. It was there for the I I was there for the opening of the Black Arts Matters, and so it's like the three versions of the motherland is what it's called. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's really incredible, of course. And I love puppets and all that kind of stuff. Ah, so. It was it was pretty great. Uh, okay, so there, if there are no other announcements, our our next um, agenda items are on. For our next meeting on the 23rd, we will revisit um, the proposed amendments to bylaw 3.33, refuse collection and recyclables. Um, and we will be joined by uh, Zero Waste Amherst for their presentation. And there may be uh, street lights going on there as well, if um, Anna and Randy are ready for that time. Uh, so, but those are just upcoming. Great. And with the presentation, you mean the survey that they did? So they'll be sharing the results from that, right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, also, I will put together all the questions so far that we have, but if you can think of any, and I will send you all the list of questions that we discussed last time. And if anyone wants to add anything before, then I send it to Paul. Yes. I'll try to send it today. Thank you, Shalini. Thank you for your uh, lead with this and all the work you're doing and Andy and the rest of the sponsors. Okay, so with that, wishing everyone a great evening. Yay. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.